Welcome to this spotlight. Um, GISD Alliance member, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for attending the Sustainable Development Goals Investment Fair. After hearing a very thought provoking panel on shifting incentives towards the long term investing, we will move on to discussing the development and implementation of the SDG related metrics. I look forward to the insights that our exceptional panel of experts will bring forward today. We have with us today Mr. Jose Minaya, CEO of Nubin. Welcome. Mr. Douglas Peterson, President and CEO of SP Global. Welcome. Mr. Alberto Di Paoli, CFO of NLSP. Welcome. Mr. Amit Buri, CEO of Global Impact Investing Net Network. Welcome to. And we are just waiting for Mr. Jace Andrews, our investment manager of Calper, who will be joining us shortly. So welcome, gentlemen. Um, I'm very happy to be here. My name is Rina Kupfer-Schmidt Rojas. I'm the head of sustainable finance for UBS. And today we would like to discuss with you a topic that is very, very uh, relevant at this point, which is actually how we can create metrics, metrics to measure impact and more specific on the SDG investments. So the way that um, this discussion is gonna work, I'm gonna give you two or three minutes for each of you to give your view on the status of, of the companies that you're representing, but also on the status of um, SDG related metrics. So maybe let me start with you, Jose um, um, and Nubin. Um, I know you guys have been doing a lot in the space and we have been working as well in our task force and doing metrics. So maybe you wanna share a little bit more of insights what Nubin is doing in the space. Sure. Again, and, and and thank you for having me. This is you know uh, this is a topic that is is kind of very critical and, and and top of mind for us. Look, I think across Nuveen today, you know, we manage a little over a, a trillion dollars across the globe, every asset class. But there's three things, or three pillars that we talk about that's a differentiator for Nuveen. You know, one is income solutions because we've been doing it for over 100 years. Alternatives because we manage over 300 billion in that particular asset class, but then it's ESG and responsible investing. And, and, and why is that such a critical piece to our business? Well, one, we've been doing it for over 50 years, right? It's our DNA and because it's so important to our stakeholders. One of the big things that we do is we manage money for college professors, faculty and staff across universities across the US. This has clearly been on their minds and an important issue uh, for again, for decades now. So it's something we've gotten very familiar with. We're an asset owner and an asset manager, right? So of that trillion dollars, about half of it, we're managing on behalf of our own balance sheet, our own participants, again, those professors. So we, we, we take that to light and also in managing the money for other institutions and retail investors. And that led to a portfolio of call around 40 billion of products and strategies that are labeled uh, uh, ESG. We also manage real assets and natural resources, things like farmland, timber, real estate, that's kind of led us down the path of knowing when you own assets for 30 plus years, um, the impact that, that those assets have, the impact that they have on communities, um, the integrity of those assets, they matter to the investment performance. So it's kind of developed a view for us that it's a, that, you know, doing this and managing these risks is critical for also uh, driving alpha in our portfolios. So our focus has been around three things, engagement and how we connect with our boards and how we vote proxies and the discussions we have. Transparency, which has evolved tremendously. I'd say this year was our first year issuing a, a, a public engagement report that is helping the public see and, and see, well, how are we voting proxies? Why are we voting them that way? How many meetings do we have with management throughout the year? What are the questions we ask? What are the case studies that we also showed around from these discussions? What did some firms do? What did some firms not do? What was our behavior coming from that? And then lastly is the investment process, which is something that we have now got into a place where 100% of our AUM, all trillion plus dollars, are informed by ESG risk factors in the investment process. And that was important from an alpha perspective because it was driving infrastructure where RPMs can have access to ratings and information on ESG levels at every, at every company we hold, whether it's an index or whether it's an, or whether it's an active fund. It's the training we did with all of our um, with all our, all our um, uh, portfolio managers. But the reality is now is that the narrative has changed. And I feel with all the work that we've been doing in the industry, what's happened now is that whether you're an employee, whether you're a client or whether you're a shareholder, everyone's asking about this. And it's no longer about 
are we going to get lower returns, higher fees, because I just want access to the strategy? No, the expectation is that managers kind of carry and share the values of their clients and their people. The expectation is that fees will actually be lower and returns will be higher. Yet what's important about this dialogue today is that where I think the biggest challenge in the industry and where it's very nascent, it comes down to measurement. It comes down to consistent metrics and standards. The language that we all use is different. The acronyms we all use are different. What you're seeing now is that perfect storm with all three of those key stakeholders for all of us pushing this question. You're seeing you know, policymakers come in. You're seeing regulatory uh, re regulators coming in. That is the push that you needed in this industry to start having and saying, well, where are now firms prioritizing their spend as it relates to bringing this all together? And while I like to say we're way ahead of the curve and what we've done internally with our portfolios, where it's still a lot of work is getting those metrics, getting enough history and data and attribution analysis that can really kind of defend uh, the, the philosophy behind this. Yeah, very interesting. And, and um, I agree with you that um, this is coming now across the board, not only for the financial sector. Now consumers are asking for more transparency. And actually, um, if you look now at corporations putting data out there, um, they're trying to be also more accurate and what kind of information they are doing. So um, have you seen in terms of of you know you, you are an asset owner but also an asset manager so in your position of an asset manager from from your investors what exactly is they ask what is exactly that they're asking you to do to create more reports to give you to give them more a blueprint of their portfolio so what exactly is they ask you know the biggest ask really is kind of understanding what we do right so they're here like again there's a lot of confusion in terms of what these things mean but the biggest ask is okay we understand that climate change could be a risk right that you could be holding fossil fuel names and eventually there's a transition and there's going to be money lost there's wildfires or these things they're hearing and seeing all these things and they care about them the simple ask right now is one of well tell us what you're doing what are you doing about this? And, and what are the questions you're asking? How does this find its way in your portfolio? I could tell you that there's not a single RFP or request for information that we get that doesn't have some question around this. And it used to be very easy because they were focused around our energy investments. So they were focused around our real estate or agriculture investments. Now, if we're doing a senior loan fund, they want to understand how this gets played into. So while we went through a big period of trying to educate our staff, in certain pockets, if they were corporate bond or investment grade bond portfolio manager, they're like, well, this isn't that important to me. Guess what? It is now. And they're all, they've all come back to the center saying, help us understand this because the questions are coming in. So in some ways, it's not just reporting. It's, it's as simple as that question. Can you help us understand what your firm does? And because this has not been a critical focus other than talking about it for a lot of firms, it's a hard thing to catch up on. Do you have the infrastructure? Can you come up with reports and answer those questions? And that is why you're seeing a lot more activity from the industry because they're all playing catch up. Yeah, that's very interesting. Thank you, Jose. I think, uh, Doc, um, I mean, SMP inform and have a lot of products around ESG. This is something that, that is not new for you guys. So maybe maybe you want to give us an, an overview where you are focusing right now and, and what is the main contribution to to the sdgs and impact and related metrics well thank you and thank you for <clears throat> thank you first of all for hosting the event today uh we appreciate being able to talk and also listen and learn from the other panelists uh, at s p global we actually have uh, products and services within the ESG a space that go back over 20 years when we first launched the Dow Jones Sustainability Index. But let me just talk in three broad areas of what we're doing. Uh, at the top, first of all, at the company itself, about five or six years ago, we said to ourselves, if we want to be a credible company providing data and analytics and ratings and benchmarks to the markets, we have to operate at our own company at the highest standards. So at our own company, we have at our board level, we discuss our own ESG performance, our climate performance. We have we actually do the TCFD. We one of the only companies that has uh, provided a carbon adjusted EPS score for ourselves. And we also have very uh, disclosure that we've done for the company. The second thing we've done across the board is decided that we needed to have an ESG team within our company that cuts across all of our divisions. 
We had been for many years, uh, as I say, it let a thousand flowers bloom. And we had a whole series of different SDG products, ESG products across the company. And we decided that we needed to be more organized in a way that we would have a similar and the a house view on ESG that we'd be able to provide uh, consistent data and analytics and engage with the market. And I'll come back to this set in that in just a second. And then the third thing we're doing is we're engaging with all of the policymakers around the world. We're active with different groups like the Task Force for Climate Related Financial Disclosure, with SASB, with IFRS. I'm a member of the IBC at the World Economic Forum. And we believe that we need to be with the organizations that are setting standards for disclosure that will be very important for the private sector to be giving the information that uh, people like Nuveen are going to need to make decisions about their own investment portfolios. Coming back to the second set of activities at S&P Global, as I said, we've been doing this for over 20 years, and we've also been doing some acquisitions the last few years. We bought a company called True Cost. Uh, True Cost has data and analytics around carbon, around carbon attribution. They have, we have SDG evaluators, water, waste, et cetera. Within our ratings business, we, have a, we do a green bond evaluations. We also do ESG evaluations uh, that look at different factors of companies in the E and the S and the G. We've standardized, standardized those and also looked at those for different industries. In our commodities pricing business plats, we have a whole series of of what we call um, energy transition uh, products and services, looking at what's happening with new types of energy uh, development and how are, how are those doing? We do research around those. And then we, in addition to that, our index business, we have an S&P 500 ESG, uh, which is a, it's now being used by many different investors around the world. It's in many different ETFs. And then finally, we have a set of data and uh, data and, and other services as an example, uh, two and three years ago, we worked with GPI, GPIF in Japan to help them set up an entire portfolio attribution model using carbon as the main factor that they wanted to look at. And through that, then they built uh, Japanese uh, ESG funds, which are carbon uh, weighted funds within the Japanese market, which are now being used externally. So across the board, we're in data analytics, benchmarks, of finding ways that the market's going to develop. But as we'll probably talk about, the overall standards are still just now being set. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I think also uh, I, in the way that you guys are facing this, new, I will say this new phase of sustainability on ESG data. Um, what about the, the local versus the global? Um, did you see that need of, of having that distinction? So based, based on the needs of, of the asset managers? Well, there's really two things that, that the more we can make it global and we can have similar or the same standards globally, it's going to be much more valuable to the markets. Uh, the largest uh, asset managers are global investors. They're investing in portfolios around the globe. Many of their investors are also tend to be global. And so the more we can converge on the same standards globally is going to be really valuable. <clears throat> but the second point is that there's a equivalent of the S&P 500 or the S&P 2000. There's a, a maybe 10 or 15 or 20,000 companies around the world that are larger uh, listed on public markets. But there's beyond that, there's literally millions of companies in the supply chain. And there's hundreds of thousands of companies that either are smaller or they're in the private markets. And it's also important that these standards that we're thinking of developing, that we're working on, go beyond just that top 10,000, 20,000 publicly listed, publicly traded companies and get into the supply chain as well, into the SME sector. Yeah, yeah. That's, that's really interesting because we, we see that with the, with the CO2 emission, scope one, scope two, uh, but I don't see it for other type of data on the social or in the governance. Um, so that's a really interesting insight. I will get back to you on that. Yeah. So now, Alberto, um, NL and the company, uh, we would like to get your view on, on this whole awakening of environmental, social and governance data and how your company is contributing to this. I think you are mute, Alberto, if you can unmute yourself, sorry. Okay. Sorry. Thank you. Uh, so good afternoon to you all. So it's um, I think it's uh, um, it's useful to to share with you some so the path that the company has followed in the in the last year. So we decided uh, uh, at a certain time in the past in 2016 uh, 
to completely change uh, the strategy and the business model of this company and focusing sustainability within so the business concept of the company and the strategies of the company before we were doing something like others so we were doing so we are trying to have good esg ratings we are trying to flag some things but not so decided to put at the center of our business concept sustainability at that time we changed uh, for to give you an example we changed completely the sdg in which we focus on before we were focusing doing something for you know extraction or health uh, or others then we decided we are not working in our business in this field we are working in other sdgs but we decided to have other sdgs target like the seven so clean energy the nine uh, uh, infrastructure, uh, sustainable cities, uh, and climate action that are now the SDGs in which we are working. And then up with this, we have uh, completely reshaped the way and the strategy of the company. So we looked at the new market that this new perspective would open. So we, we, and now we are working on these kind of trends and these kind of markets. And the second, we change completely the way we communicate. So the target, the KPI, everything that we say to the market, we will do, and so we are doing. But also we have innovated the sustainable finance because so we found only green bonds in the market. But when a company doesn't do one or two projects that can flag and cover to a green bond, but do 100% of his activity in sustainability, Green Bond is not the right response. So we decided to innovate the sustainable finance, issuing an SDG, the first SDG link bond. That is not, not only a change of the name, it's a change of the concept of the sustainable finance. And this is all, so this is our experience that so we have a concept that sustainability is value. Then we, we have to report what, what is the value. Is the value for the company? Is the value for uh, customers? Is the value for society? And so this can be, have to be standardized. Mm -hmm. But the final result for, so that is, I think, a good, uh, a good sign that sustainability creates value. And we started our company at a capital market of 35 billion euros. Today is 90. So we triple our capital market value since the time in which we decided to completely change this, uh, our strategy into this. So have you seen Alberto um, change on, on, on the type of investors or, or people who would like to be part of, of this when you change your narrative from, from a traditional one to the SDG and trying to measure and be on link? Have you, have you seen a change in the type of investors? Well, absolutely. So we changed uh, almost, uh, so I don't know, 40, 50% of our investors. We had uh, an SRI participation of 3%. Now we are working on 15. 17 percent and uh, so everything has changed but at the time in which we 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 reached the top of the sg uh, ranking of the the most important index we saw an a, a, a steep increase in our valuation the, the the day after so we got it so uh, it's clear that so now the world is moving towards this kind of things that's why and so we will discuss after is now relevant to standardize and harmonize. So the way in which the company reports, uh, so the investors can get it. Uh, and to give you another so point of discussion, we have two different views on, on sustainability. Europe is going towards taxonomy and a, a certain way to do it. Now we are discussing on SDGs, this is another, co another concept. I think that the harmonization is, is very relevant because there are different roads and I understand that on, on the investor side, it may be confusing, a lot of confusing. Yeah, 
I guess we have been there and I, and I think this is a perfect transition to Amit and the Global <laughs> Impact Investing Network. Um, and I mean, you, you guys have been trying to create a little bit of, I would say, um, make it less complex for investors to understand and how to measure and what really impact is, right? Um, and the journey has been, you know, a little bit bumpy. And if we, we actually shared a panel in Davos about mm -hmm. three, four years ago, and yeah. we were inviting investors to come and we were thought, oh my God, nobody's gonna show up. And at the end, we, we have some people coming. And I think if we would have done that today, the room will be overbooked. Um, so in your experience, what, what have you seen in the transition specific to the data? What we have seen is an acceleration, the velocity now of need yeah. of data. Um, and how you guys are, are contributing to that. Sure, absolutely. No, thank you, Rena, and thanks uh, to, you know, to the GISD for having me here, and it's an honor to be here with all the uh, my fellow panelists. Um, a, a couple things that you know I think are so important when we have this conversation with an eye towards the sustainable development goals. Um, soon after they were launched, I thought a lot of like the um, the corporate and investment leadership was uh, around the SDGs was very much focused on alignment, you know, which is essentially like a classification or categorization. Um, and I remember having this conversation with Rena years ago uh, about how the next step is then around contribution. Um, so not just, you know, is this an energy company thinking about clean energy, but what are we actually contributing to this goal? Um, and of course, it's challenging with um, this SDGs because they are global goals. You know, they're set for countries to think about their contribution um, to a global agenda. Um, and so we at the Global Impact Investing Network, um, you know, really work to help um, translate these global goals into operational metrics that investors could use to think about their positive contribution. Um, as a brief bit of background on, on the, my organization, the GIN for short, um, we work with a, a, a global network of over 300 investors, um, over 35,000 know, people who are engaged with us um, that are, include big institutions like UBS and Nuveen, who've been very active in our network and, and also many smaller boutique firms. Um, but what we have been working on with when it comes to measurement and data um, is the need for high quality measurement that captures investor contribution to impact towards the SDGs in a way that is standardized and comparable. Uh, and, and I think that is work has been embodied in work that we've done with an, in a system called IRIS Plus. Uh, it's IRIS with the plus sign, um, well known to some of the folks on, on the panel and I'm sure some people in the audience, uh, which has over, it's free to use, it has over 17,000 users around the world and growing. Um, but IRIS Plus is designed to translate um, those you know, high level goals to core investment strategies all the way down to core metric sets. Um, as we get more and more investors using the same metrics, that allows us to, um, you know, it's essentially using the same language, which means now we can communicate. And that's where the desire for data and comparability is so key. We now see when we speak to CIOs of major pension funds, insurance companies, endowments and beyond, um, not only an interest in opportunities for investment, but a great demand for comparable data that they can use to inform their decision making. So how do they understand the positive contributions across um, you know, specific investments and more importantly across a portfolio? How do they benchmark that performance towards other investors in the same sector? So it could be you know, something like sustainable agriculture, um, affordable housing or, or other areas. Um, but ultimately, we need that type of impact data um, at the fingertips of investors so they can use, um, you know, sit with their financial um, performance data alongside the ESG data, you know, and their understanding of the kind of risk factors posed, um, as well as the contributions towards positive impact. Um, and I think that is where we see the market moving. Um, and I would have said the same thing um, kind of a, you know, a, a year and a half ago. Um, about the demand that we're seeing growing, but I think COVID and, and the crisis that we're all going through around the world is accelerating that interest. Um, so we see investors wanting to understand their, their, the role of their investments and their data on everything from mitigating climate change to advancing gender equity and racial equity. Um, and I think there's a, a very powerful role for investors and companies alike um, you know, to help contribute to progress on these important goals in a measurable, comparable way. So, I mean, have you seen, now that you mentioned COVID, um, I call it the awakening of, of the ESG and acceleration. Um, so what kind of, what kind of metrics now are, are investors in, in your network interested in to, to gather? 
Yeah. yeah. Well, I, I think what we've seen is certainly like, you know, ESG has gone mainstream and the, the kind of support and encouragement from, you know, from regulators in many parts of the world is actually moving that to be what I just think will soon become business as usual in, in terms of like looking at these factors um, as they pertain to, to risk and financial materiality. Um, and that's a huge leap forward compared to where we were three years ago, five years ago, you know, let alone uh, some of you have been working in the space even longer and have, have seen the whole journey. Um, where I think we see the the you know what what's on the horizon um, you know amongst you know investors large and small is wanting to of course understand their ESG factors but also understand um, their positive impact and the language we hear used includes contribution, impact, outcomes, and solutions. Um, but for us, that's all about how can we not only capture the you know financial elements of these um, ESG factors, which are of course you know incredibly important. But how do we also understand how our investments are contributing to addressing many of the issues um, that we're seeing all around us? Um, and this um, is, is certainly what we're seeing demand coming from mainstream institutions. Um, you know, and and I, we've actually seen a huge surge of interest from um, pension funds and insurance companies um, in these areas, and that's um, you know from a global basis. So those based in Europe, you know, U.S., Canada. Um, uh, you know, certainly in Australia, as well as in, in Asia. And, and we expect that only to gain momentum um, as, as the, um, you know, as the months and, and, and years unfold. Yeah, very really interesting. Thank you. Now, James, CalPERS is one of the largest institutional investors right now pushing um, the agenda. For many, many years now, you guys have had a strategy on ESG and the integration. Um, also in the markets, we call it the CalPERS effect. So when CalPERS actually go and integrate into, into one asset class or, or another, so people will go and follow. So from an investor perspective um, and, and the role CalPERS can play into this agenda of the metrics, what is the work that you guys are focusing right now and what you are more excited about? We're focused in a number of areas, integration, research, advocacy, engagement, and partnership with others. And so when we are looking at the, the goals, we do want to make certain that our research is integrated with the asset classes in a way in which we do make investment decisions based upon what we, what we find. We advocate in many places for issues that are directly in line with that are directly in line with the goals. More specifically, um, we advocate on the legislative level, having testified before Congress on the issues such as climate change, human capital management, human rights, um, country by country tax, account tax accounting, and more that align um, with the goals. We also advocate with standard setters. I sit on the advisory committee of the um, FASB, which is called FASAC, and on the IFRS advisory committee as well. So we want climate, climate change and human capital issues to be displayed more prominently within the financials. It's not only as a disclosure metric in other places, such as um, management commentary or MD&A on risk factors, but in the financials as appropriate. We believe in actually moving some of these disclosure issues into regulatory reporting, because where the information is reported does in fact matter. A great example of that is in mine safety. Although the, inf although the information on mine safety was greatly available, only until it became a regulatory disclosure issue that we see a substantial change in mine safety. And I think this theme needs to run throughout. We're talking about the, the goals are the appropriate ones. And we talk and we say the right things, but what we want to do is make actual changes in behavior. And in a troubling way that has not occurred. The goals are the right one, and we're promoting health care. But in the face of the greatest pandemic, we see around the world that rich countries are being taken care of immensely, where poor countries are not. And so when stress is imposed 
we see that a number of institutions aren't walking their talk. And so we're advocating not only for the right communication to be held, but for there to be actual changes in behavior. We also had membership on the SEC Investor Advisory Committee, which has prominently featured a number of um, proposals to the SEC to make substantial changes. However, until this year, none of those changes um, met the light of day. We are in a new environment now, and we believe that we have regulators and legislators who will in fact listen to our side and understand the importance that these issues play with investors. We also engage. The most prominent thing that we engage on is through Climate Action 100 Plus. So CalPERS played a significant role in convening the group that created Climate Action 100 Plus, or in fact the co-founder. I believe that this global initiative is the most significant work of a group of investors having an impact on having an, an impact on climate change. Through it, we've gotten substantial responses from substantial climate emitters in which they have set targets and we have and we are looking at the appropriate metrics to align ourselves to make certain that those changes are met. This is important as well. Most of the things we talk about and the disclosures we're talking about are things we want to happen in the future. Unfortunately, many laws do not allow, do, do not align with us being able to act on these things. For example, in the, in the United States, if a company sets a target, let's say on one of these goals and fails to meet that target, they will see no liability whatsoever. So there is no penalty whatsoever other than that which is inflicted by investors at some later date for failing to meet a target. But a target is seen as an aspirational goal. The failure to meet an aspirational goal does not incur liability whatsoever. So we need to make certain that companies have the right metrics, set the right targets, and actually meet those targets, which means we have to monitor them along the path to make certain that they meet those targets. Finally, as I highlighted, we work through partnerships. Many of the things that an individual investor would like to do cannot be accomplished alone. In fact, we operate in a state in which if a single investor, unless you're one of the really large investors, contacts a company, they may not get a response. But when they work as a collective for the same goal, a response is more likely and basically working with those investors is more likely as well. So those are the things we're doing. We're focused on integration, research, advocacy, engagement, and partnership. Thank you, James. I think the, the point about the regulation and, you know, how, you know, can we make companies accountable is, is a good one and how, you know, as an investor, perhaps we also have the role not not to not to I will say to, to finger point, but actually to measure and make sure that companies are making progress towards what we call the positive impact. I'm getting questions from from the audience. So and this one is for Jose. Can you please describe the mechanisms you use to support the SDG as a public equity investor? I mean, I think the different things, the different things that we do, right? One, it, it starts with kind of the foundation of a, of our investment process, right? Which, and we just incorporate the SDGs and the goals and kind of understand how does this play into the portfolio construction process? What, how does that drive the different ratings that we put in, right? So we, today, every single portfolio manager can go on their desktop and they're going to have an ESG kind of tear sheet or review for that company. They're going to analyze even within the SDGs around like, okay, which ones does this hit? Which ones does it not? What does it mean? And then the important piece is taking that information. And this is where a lot of the training come in, comes in of saying, how will these things potentially impact the valuation of this firm? How will it potentially impact the performance of this firm? 
and doing that, right? So it's like taking that framework and then making it a formal part of kind of the security selection process tied with also the education and training around what this is all mean. Like for example, if it's a climate change issue, you know, we brought in a lot of scientists and climate change people, not to just talk about climate change, but to also talk about and say, well, how would this hurt the logistics business? Or how would this hurt the hotel business? Or how would this hurt these different kind of impacts? So that as investment professionals, they're kind of learning this the same way they're learning about cash flow, the same way they think about credit risk. They're thinking about this risk like anything, like anything else. Yeah, interesting. I have another question for Doug. Uh, do you see a need for harmonized, standardized sector specific metrics to measure a company's contribution to the SDGs? Uh, that's a great question. We really should start heading towards standardization, as I mentioned before. In addition, you want to think about industry. And let's talk about what was brought up before the mining industry. If I compared this, let's say standardized ESG factors, SDG factors, let's take, for example, greenhouse gas, <coughs> water, waste, land use. Uh, if you thought about the social factors of workforce and diversity, safety, uh, how you think about the community, and let's compare the difference between a mining company and an advertising agency or services firm. If you think about that, the those factors, those very simple ones I just named are gonna be completely different. Think about land use, think about safety, the difference between a, pub, a private a public a, a services company versus a mining company. So it is necessary for us in the next iteration of setting standards that we also look at by industry, by activity, um, so that you can have much more granular data that really applies specifically to each company. Yeah, yeah. interesting. Alberto, there is one for you. Uh, can you explain more about the SDG link bond? And I think you're still mute. <laughs> uh, SDG link bond uh, uh, comes from uh, um, a philosophy that is what I was touching before. So, when the market, the sustainable finance market, was and is already so, I don't say now 100% on green bonds, we think, we thought, and now we think that it's not a way in which a company is flagging this way towards sustainability. It's only flagging that, that the company is doing uh, some projects, sustainable projects. But if we want the sustainability we will become mainstream we have to find the way in which sustainability is the business and will create value will create profits uh, and will reduce risk of the company and on one side is that financing for the sustainability for companies that are this kind of path has to be to lower as a cost versus the normal financing and green bonds are not providing this because they are not linked to the company, they are linked to project. When we decided to offer to bondholders the company, we said, okay, we have to innovate this kind of, of system because we have to offer a, a path towards sustainability and we have to link it on the profits, the growth, the risk of the company. It is the only way to have a clear understanding and to move towards a new way to proposing business that is exactly the same that we, are, we were proposing before in a different context. What we got from this at the very beginning was a discount because we got a discount in issuing these bonds versus our normal bond. And we got four or five times the demand for our first bond. Then we issued other bonds, but four years, for one year, one year and a half, we were alone in the market. No one was issuing the second sustainable link bond. And this is clear why, because you have to change your company before. You can't issue it without changing yourself. Now it's becoming mainstream. This year, so sustainable link bonds uh, are set to be 150 billion euros of issuance in the year. So for JP Morgan analysis, uh, now ECB, is buying because at the very beginning ECB said we don't buy this kind of, uh, of instruments. Now ECB is buying them and is creating a link between taxonomy and SDG 
for the first time in the first European institution, because ECB said, I'm buying a sustainable link bond based on taxonomy, but also based on SDG 7, 9, 11, and 13. So this is something that is moving. And we think that only having an holistic approach to sustainability is the way in which we can drive the world toward these new things. Not having one specific view on the sustainability has to do, has to be that way. And metrics and the way in which we have to describe this process are very relevant, but they have to follow this. Not only to have uh, a shop to say the company is today is, is this, and so you are good or, or, or bad because you are not full sustainable or not. So metrics have to be comprehensive of all the steps that we are doing towards a, a, a change of the model, because it's a very, very big shift. And the second, clearly, to say that all the companies that are within this path eh, are moving toward this and deserve because their business are going to change in a better way deserve to have money at lower cost deserve to have the better investors in and so to have from this kind of things a higher value visible that will attract others to this kind of behaviors mm -hmm. i see um, Amit, you talk about contribution, moving more from being aligned to the SDGs and, and, and that investors now want to see what is the contribution. Do you have any specific examples of how an investor trying to measure the impact in the contribution that they have? How can they do that and probably mm -hmm. use, you know, the IRIS plus metrics to do it? Sure. Absolutely. And, and I'll, I'll try to also connect this with the question that went, went to, um, um, you know, Doug, about the standardization and the need for that around, you know, sector specific, because I think that also is something that we think a lot about. So we, we think about the, the way that we need kind of metrics around contributions, both sector specific, as well as some that are cross cutting. And what I mean by cross cutting are things like racial equity, uh, gender equity, uh, quality jobs um, and climate mitigation. Um, and these are things that can be relevant in any sector, you know, and so um, your impact, for example, on um, contributing to, you know, kind of health, um, you know, the health and well-being of families and communities, you know, part of that would be in, the, in providing quality employment. So not just counting the quantity of jobs, but also the quality of jobs and the various kind of benefits and rights and other things that are available to employees in a given country that helps lead towards financial security at, at a household, you know, at an individual and household level. Um, another way to think about this on a sector specific basis though, is you could look at something like, um, you know, like uh, sustainable agriculture. Um, and, and there's an incredibly important opportunity both to think about, you know, kind of classical metrics like, you know, the, the reach of the land and all, as, as well as, um, you know, kind of what types of employment opportunities and for whom are being offered by this, um, you know, by the, the agricultural um, project. What are the greenhouse gas emissions? What are the, you know, it's the element of carbon sequestration, kind of the land management practices and others. Um, and, and, and of course, each of these is its own realm and its own science. And so we work with external partners for each sector um, and go through a whole stakeholder driven um, process, uh, which both UBS and Nuveen have been quite active in over the years and helping to contribute to that, where it's a mix of investors, companies, technical experts and, and researchers and others. Um, but ultimately, what it boils down to is um, a set of core metrics that are generally accepted, backed up by evidence um, that are freely available as a public good. Um, and so they're openly accessible. So um, it could be, to the early example, companies in the supply chain that are you know, um, selling products to a big corporate that's public, um, as well as on the investors. We can get that entire kind of value chain linked up using the same metrics. Um, for how they understand your contributions to a sustainable development goal or a specific impact theme. I um, mean, I think that's ultimately what, what we want, a frictionless kind of way of communicating about impact, measuring it, comparing it, benchmarking it, um, so we can all make better decisions that are informed by the actual contributions uh, to the, the things that motivate us to, to be you know, um, you know, uh, involved in responsible and impact investing in the first place. Yeah, interesting. James, from, from an institutional investor perspective um, and, and the broad of investments that you guys have, do you, what would be, in your view, 
um, you know, we talk about harmonization, we talk about contribution, you talk about actually, you know, being accountable. So in, in your view as an institutional investor, what do we need to do now to, to make it happen? And, and what else the investor community can be doing when, when looking at these metrics? So, so what we are doing is looking at a fundamental change in how we view materiality and how information has to be reported. For the past um, decade or more, there's been a movement of narrowing materiality, which means there's been an attempt to make less information material and therefore we get less transparency from the companies. Now we're in a movement to actually look at the foundational laws to show that those laws take into account the needs of the public interest. We're looking at, in the, in the US, the foundational court cases which show that materiality did not have some sort of financial component but in fact, were in fact voting cases. And the voting cases, for example, TSC versus Northway was a voting case and the holding made it clear that materiality was determined in providing information in how a shareholder votes, that shareholders actually need more information. So showing that materiality goes well beyond what the, what the financial materiality that some speak of and more to what investors need to make financial decisions, including voting decisions, that means that we have a regulatory requirement that the companies do in fact need to provide us additional information. And with that expansion of materiality, we get a regulatory purpose to get the information that we seek. Some of the information that we're talking about, when provided, is provided voluntarily. Um, largely, companies provide it only when it benefits them and not in cases when it may look, make them look bad. And even when they provide it outside of the regulatory reports in, on, a, on a voluntary basis, if there's a failure in the information to provide it, there's nothing really that can be done about it directly, except have a conversation the following year. And so where we sit is that we want the maximum amount of information to be provided transparent, transparently through regulatory reports. And in order to do that, we have to have a reimagining of the term materiality and expand what companies are supposed to provide within their regulatory reports. Yeah, I think that's so much needed. I'm going to ask this question to all of the panelists and I'm going to start with Jose. Jose, if I give you a magic wand and you could change the harmonization of the standards and we will have only one standard how to measure SDG impact, how would you do it? And, and this is the main challenge that we have right now in our task force and most of the investors, the amount of information that, that we do. How will you go about? Yeah, it's a, that's a hard question, but I look, I think on one end, there's one simple answer, which is, look, you've got, what we know is coming is that you've got the regulators and government entities, they're on this now. That that train has left the station and, and it's coming. You've seen now the consultants are out there and they're reporting on this as well. Um, it's going to behoove the asset management industry to come together and create quickly create our own standards. Today, we've been very bifurcated, right? We all have our own languages that we, around what we say, what we do here. We do different things, but now we're gonna be forced to come together, right? Because when that regulation comes in, and this is like, you're gonna have to come up with that consistent language, which really the, the old adage of you lock yourself in a room and you say, okay, well, what is it we're agreeing to? And by the way, from this, what's gonna be our response back to the regulators? Because as much as we're all doing this, those things can sometimes come in disrupt, disruptive ways that maybe are not always helpful. And there's that lack of information and communication that's happening between these different parties. So it's uh, the time has arrived for the asset management to come together, come with consistent standards and languages. It's not gonna be perfect, it never is, but we all have to kind of at least be able to say what uh, the SDGs really mean to us, what ESG is and how we implement it in our firms. And then the most important piece how do, we all, how do we all agree to measure it, right? Because 
that's the part that's missing. No one was ever really pushed or required to measure it in any way. So everyone just came up with their own kind of type of solution. I mean, SDGs is a great example. We were, before they existed, we had our own metrics and ideas of what we did. The minute they came out, we said, okay, this is terrific. There is a framework out there. There is something for us to follow. It looks really good. It might be slightly different than ours. It's close enough. Let's kind of huddle behind this. Let's use this into our framework because it's something that is consistent and it's out there. And that is the key thing to me. It's that, you know, you just have to get to that point. Yeah, interesting. Doc, so you have the magic wand right now. So what would you do? Well, I would, I would, first of all, there's some good news. And the good news is that recently, a few of the different groups that have been heading down their own path have started coming together. So recently, the IBC, which is the uh, International Business Council of the World Economic Forum, uh, SASB, GRI, have agreed to join forces with what IFRS is doing. But the, the magic wand, as you say, I, I completely agree with Jose just said from Nuveen about bringing together the asset management, uh, asset management industry. I think that there's uh, an opportunity, if I want to call it a public-private partnership, of the organizations like IOSCO, with the asset managers, with the accounting industry, I'd bring in the rating agencies, I'd make sure you have property casualty insurance there as well. Uh, they've got some of the best data about climate risk, and I'd bring some impact investors and, and find a way to make sure that we can get a single river, a single stream, if you want to call it that, a work stream. Uh, but I think IOSCO is going to be critical to this because that's the way you can get a, a global approach and standardization to the SDGs, uh, to the reporting. Uh, I want to make one final comment, kind of follows up from what uh, James said a few minutes ago, as well as this comment. Today in the United States of the S&P 500 companies, 90% of the companies would probably tell you that they're already disclosing this data. But the way they're disclosing it is through CSR reports, sustainability reports, uh, maybe community reports. It's not going into financial disclosure. It's not going into uh, regulatory documents. And so of that, only about 17% of the companies in the S&P 500 are disclosing some type of SDG or ESG information into their disclosure documents. So th there's, you can see the difference between somebody saying, well, I'm already doing it. Yeah, but it's self-disclosed under no standards. So I do think that we've got to get there. I've got the, I, I think that we've heard great comments from the panelists about why we need to do it. And everybody's doing things that are all incredibly innovative, but we're all doing things that are slightly different. Yeah. Alberto, from, from your company perspective, what would you do? You're still mute, sorry. <laughs> I would say of uh, the, uh, my company, so I'm, I'm, I'm proudly co-chairing the CFO task force for the SDG. So I think that uh, the, the, all the hopes can be gathered in all the, 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 the companies that are working on. And we are exactly so trying to work on this, so uh, focusing and putting uh, as a guiding star the, the, the SDG not only as a target, but also as a, the way in which we think we have to move towards sustainability. We want to have on our impact thesis on defining the SDG strategy and how the company will put SDG strategy within their own strategy. How so that we will implement new financial instruments to support this progress and also how we will communicate these things. We want, uh, and so we are trying, uh, and we are open to work with uh, everyone, and so to get all uh, the best uh, way to report, to represent this. But so I think the very aim is to show that, so doing these things, you can create a big value for your companies. Uh, and that's the very, very core of the reporting that we want to issue. And together with this, that we have a big impact, societal impact, because so uh, as the second tier, we do these things, uh, we do a big impact on society, but first we are doing a big impact on our companies. So this is the thesis and we need desperately and also harmonizing all this, this effort uh, that in, in, in various tables we are doing, uh, that at the end, the core, of the communication and the business will be this. It's the only way, so and I'm sharing 
the view of uh, hundreds of CFOs and the CFO task force. Uh, so we are so desperately waiting to, to support and to define how this way to create and to drive the new business. Thank you. Amit. Yes, thanks. Um, I um, appreciate the question and I do want that wand. Um, but I think the, uh, the way I would um, talk about it is, um, first, I think we need a shift in thinking and, and really to capture you know, what the SDGs embodied is an incredible amount of ambition. You know, it's an ambition to take on our greatest systemic issues. You know, things like ending poverty, you know, um, turning back the tide on climate change, gender equity, um, and 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 beyond. And and so I think one thing that's important for us is you know to make that transition from a a culture of kind of how do we meet minimum standards to how do we actually see ourselves as contributing to these big global goals and a mindset of that, you know, that ambition of how do we increase our contributions and fast. Um, you know, we we don't have that much time left to to achieve them. In terms of what I'd like to see on, on, on harmonization, I think a lot of it is starting to happen and, and Doug and others have spoken to this, but I, you know, ultimately what I think is important is that you know, we get crystal clear on um, the commitment of what we're building, which is not just metrics for a report, but it's actual kind of decision analytics that we need to build around the, the actual kind of common sets of data um, and we, of course, are contributing this through the work we do with IWorth Plus and partnering with a lot of the other standard setters. Um, that enable investors to have the data at their fingertips about not just what their financial performance is, but what their impact performance is um, and how they can use that data to understand how these things relate and ultimately how they can you know, ultimately try to drive greater performance across the board. Because I think that performance orientation that's so inherent to investors on so many other dimensions when it comes to financials um, is what we need to bring into the conversation when you think about achievement of the SDGs. Good. And James. I think much of our conversation has been focused on disclosures and disclosures have a particular limitation in terms of how far we can go. If I had the magic wand, I would ensure um, equal vac vaccinations around the world. We have a specific crisis and we can pat ourselves on the back and all the good things and all the great goals that we have. But in this specific crisis, the fact of the matter is that as collective, we're doing very little to actually activate those goals. But in order to activate those goals, we have to look substantially beyond um, company disclosures and actually look to governmental election. And in order to meet the goals that have been set, in most cases, we're actually not looking at company disclosures. They are a benefit. We can regulate by revelation in this manner, but to actually achieve those goals, we need governmental action. And if I had a wand, it would be governmental action to make certain that the entire world is vaccinated on a more um, equal basis. Yeah, that's very important right now. Well, I, we're running out of time. So I, um, for those who have, still have questions, we're gonna get back to you probably in writing via email. Uh, things that I heard today that might inform us on, on this journey of implementation of metrics. Uh, I heard about the public engagement and transparency, also that the narrative has changed from, from something that is more prominent now. I've heard about to have credible metrics, but also to look in the supply chain. Um, that we need to actually look beyond what the companies, um, for example, are, are reporting right now. But also, I have I have heard about um, being bold and changing the sustainable finance with new instruments, and as well, um, you know, to be mindful also of the taxonomy and how that can add value integrating this the ESG into into the companies. We have heard from um, transitioning from alignment to contribution. And also for being more active and, and act, act, asking for more disclosure. And also the need of this information that the materiality can inform also uh, the voting decision. So I think these are really important points that our panelists have made today. Unfortunately, we are one minute um, to, to the end. I want to thank you for your insights, all of you. And uh, this is now concludes the policy spotlight session on the SDG related metrics. And please stay with us for the closing remarks of the fair that will be delivered by the Under Secretary General Bill. Thank you.
Excellencies, GISD Alliance members, distinguished speakers, ladies and gentlemen. It is my honor to provide closing remarks for the 2021 SDG Investment Fair. We have heard stimulating ideas from representatives of governments, private investors, multilateral development banks, and think tanks. This year's fair witnessed the economic and social devastation brought by the COVID-19 pandemic. SDG progress has been dramatically set back with the most vulnerable segments of societies disproportionately affected. It is therefore critical to read up our efforts to recover better and to bridge the financing gap necessary to achieve the SDGs. For this to happen, both public and private actors need to act in tandem and the government should put the SDGs at the center of the recovery effort. Achieving SDGs will entail a major scaling up of investment in areas such as infrastructure, health, education, green economy, and enterprise development. Public finance remains essential, but it will need to be complemented by a large scale mobilization of private sustainable investment. This requires efforts to develop pipelines of investable projects, design innovative financial instruments and investment platforms, employ blended finance mechanisms, and implement institutional and regulatory reforms that facilitate longer term investments in sustainable development. All of these issues have been discussed during the past two days at this fair. They are also closely linked to the work of the Global Investors for Sustainable Development Alliance. The GISD Alliance work has focused on three key areas, scaling up long-term investment, shifting the incentives towards the long-term and developing and implementing SDG-related metrics. The highlight of this SDG investment fair has been the four countries that presented a range of SDG enhancing projects to interested investors, government officials from Ghana, Kenya, Jamaica, and Pakistan presented concrete investment opportunities in sectors as diverse as transportation infrastructure, clean energy, healthcare, and science and technology. I encourage countries and investors to continue the dialogue. We will also redouble our efforts to facilitate these countries' engagement with investors. Their projects will be incorporated into the SDG investment platform that the UNDP soft launched earlier today and which the GIS team alliance will support. We also invite additional countries to participate in this continuous effort. The policy spotlight sessions at the SDG investment fair produces useful recommendations in these areas. First, innovative instruments, platforms, and policies that can be utilized to catalyze finance and investment flows for sustainable infrastructure projects in developing countries. Second, measures to shift the incentives of key actors across the investment chain toward long-term investment. And the third, ways to support the development and the implementation of a clear set of SDGs related metrics that can be widely adopted and integrated into existing reporting frameworks. Dear colleagues, my department, UNDESA, is committed 
to working with all stakeholders to promote investment in a sustainable, resilient, and equitable recovery. We strongly believe that the private sector and development finance institutions need to be powerful partners in advancing the urgent priorities set out in the 2030 agenda. In closing, I thank the government representatives and the GISD Alliance for their valuable and active engagement in this event. I also thank the experts from multilateral organizations and academia for the active participation. Please be assured that I, along with my colleagues in DESA's Financing for Sustainable Development Office, remain committed to ensuring the continued success of this important annual event. As we move from response to the recovery from the pandemic, we should be emboldened in our objective to scale up the finance and the investment to achieve the 2030 agenda. We have brought together the necessary actors. Now is the time to act boldly. I thank you 